welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 Radio Program. I'm Daniel Davis. Coming up on us is Thanksgiving, and most of us get excited about the kind of bill of fare that we tend to prepare in the kitchen and send out the feast for the excitement of a celebration of Thanksgiving. On the program today, we're going to be joined by someone who's going to talk about something known as open hearth cookery. This was a practice that was in America for more than 200 years. While the hands and faces of the hardy women who cooked their families' meals over the open flames were reddened and dried by the constant heat, the origin of the expression, a red-hot mama, was born. We're going to learn about early kitchen lore and recipes from the 1800s. Examples such as meals normally consisted of a variety of boiled puddings, Corn was the staple of early Americans, the most common crop grown by early farmers, as well as traditions set by Native Americans. The book is Simple Fare, Kitchen Lore and Recipes from the 1800s. Our guest joining us today, Priscilla Rowell. Priscilla, thank you for being on the program today. Well, thank you, Daniel, for inviting me, um, and uh, I'm glad to be on uh, Beyond 50 radio show, um, coming all the way from Maryland. Very good. Now, you actually became interested in early American cookery, I understand, back in the mid-1970s with a visit to what was known as the Feast of the Hunter's Moon. Tell us about that. Well, yeah, that's at uh, Fort Wyatnon in uh, Indiana, and it's an a interesting um, celebration of the feast that uh, would happen at the Hunter's Moon, which in which the, uh, there would be the French soldiers at the fort, there would be the French voyageurs, uh, hunters and trappers coming in their uh, uh, birch bark canoes, and then there would be the Native Americans coming. And so they recreate that. And with, it's, it's, it's just quite an exciting thing to see these huge birch bark canoes coming down the Wabash and coming into uh, – the fort area and the huge uh, teepees there. So, and uh, it was just uh, really started me on an uh, interest in uh, uh, traditional cooking. I remember it was a, a good some years back. Somehow I had adopted just a couple of Weber barbecues. One was a large one, and the other was about a medium size. And uh, quite frankly, I'd never really had a whole lot of experience using charcoal. You know, I mean, I'd seen it done. But most of the time, people buy gas grills. You might as well just cook inside the house. But that being said, I remember that I had somehow had a bunch of cedar, uh, actual cedar uh, pieces, and I started trying to cook with wood, and I realized, you know, this really takes a certain feel and a flair for doing this and doing it well. And it was really exciting because it was sort of as though there was an inner creative process that was kicking into gear. And it was amazing how much the, the you know, your imagination begins to run when it comes to something like this. What was that experience like for you when you decided to go in this direction with cooking? Well, it, it was as exactly as you said. There's uh, uh, something else going on besides just turning your oven to preheat or whatever. And um, so I, I guess I really started with cooking on a wood cook stove, which has a uh, thermometer but not it, it, it tells you the temperature but it doesn't get to that unless you put the right amount of wood so you have to know like you said the woods what kind of woods are you you know and what size what a how are they dried out and stuff and so tomorrow i will be baking my turkey in my wood cook stove <laughs> I just remember, too, I was watching uh, an episode of the uh, original television series, Little House on the Prairie, and you realize this was something that mom had to do all day, every day. Now, uh, for people who aren't familiar with this process of cooking, like you were just talking about there, is this really something that's an all-day affair, or you know, is it relatively about the same amount of time when you cook like this? Well... I think that when you get comfortable and get experienced with it, for example, I'll just talk about my wood cook stove, is by the time I get it started uh, and, you know, the kindling and then get that going and larger stuff, I and by the time I'm ready to put something in the oven, the temperature's up to 350. And uh, so it's – and then you just – on the top, you just 
move your pots kind of, it's like a dance, you know, moving this, because the flat, the top is completely flat. So you're just moving the pots from the hot to the cooler areas and stuff. And uh, similar to open hearth cooking, you can remove one of the round eyes, and there the, there are the flames and everything, and you can put uh, uh, what they call a gridiron, uh, it's a slotted iron thing which holds the meat or whatever, and then the flames come up through that. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do on a cook, wood cook stove as uh, with open hearth cooking. And I think something that people don't realize when you think about open hearth cooking, you think of this huge roaring fire, and you're going to be cooking over this huge roaring fire, and that's really not the case. The fire is really there to make the coals, the embers, so that unless you're boiling water, you, you know, which you want over, hanging over on a metal crane hanging down onto the flames, what you're doing is you uh, are cooking down hearth. That means you scrape the uh, coals to different areas on the hearth. That's why they are so huge. That's why they're, you know, six feet wide, the uh, brick or stone, so that you can have a, a bunch of coals that are for the, you know, hotter or cooler or, or you know, what, uh, so there, you really can get it very exact. It's, it's kind of interesting how you can do that when you know what you're doing, of course, which takes. I know I'm reminded as you were uh, describing that uh, time where I lived in a place that had a uh, cast iron uh, wood stove. And uh, it was a lot of fun because one night the electricity went out right in the middle. I was cooking something. And I thought, you know, what the heck? I had the fire going. And so threw another log or two in there. Started playing with the temperature, and sure enough, I was doing stir fry on the stove top and everything else, and and that was a lot of fun. And then there was a time where I was just kind of you know enjoying watching movies, and there I was sitting by the wood stove again, and busted out some Oktoberfest sausages, put them on the end of a clothes hanger, and just kind of sat there and slowly roasted them while I was sitting there watching a movie, you know, and realized that it just how much fun that actually was, you know, and just kind of became a, a nice little addicting habit there, so. Well, there is something about uh, a fire, the uh, wood fire. That's that's. Uh, um, in fact, when stoves start, uh, iron stoves started taking over in the mid to late 1800s, there was a real uh, cry of loss for the comfort of the open fire, and people said it brought the you know it brought your families together, and you'd sit by the open fire, and you know, in the through the winter, and crack nuts or do some sewing or, you know, kindling, whatever, carving. And so there was a real uh, uh, bemoaning the loss of, of that wonderful, comforting open fire. Now, we've certainly talked a lot about cooking as far as the open flame and, and, and so forth. Now, let's talk about a lot of the recipes that you share in the book and where they came from. Well, I did start um, getting interested in old cookbooks uh, more than 40 years ago. And so I think what really started me on this cookbook was coming across, um, it looked just like a little notebook. And um, the, it said it was an antique mall, and they said it was uh, from the 1900s. And I looked at it, and I thought, boy, that handwriting doesn't look like, that looks much earlier. And it turned out that this was a cookbook of from a um, manor house in Virginia, uh, the uh, Bell Grove, which was built by Josh Height, who was with the first um, uh, English, or he was German, uh, uh, settlers who came into the Shenandoah Valley, and uh, so this and this was typical of cookbooks uh, that. It went through generations, so you have the different handwriting, you have uh, people signing the, the names or the initials, but it, these go through generations. It's like Martha Washington's cookbook. That's not her cookbook per se. She inherited it from her, the mother of her first husband, and then she then in turn handed it down to her granddaughter. So you have this, uh, it's interesting to get these, uh, collect these cookbooks and then to see um, all the history that's behind them and how they differ from the recipes today. Uh, and they call for loaf sugar, which of course is how they used to sell it. 
Or my favorite is butter the size of a walnut <laughs> you know, uh, in flour, and then that's like a roux. And so there are all these fun things that you can look when you find these handwritten cookbooks or very early cookbooks. Um, and we, we're talking about our wonderful holiday of Thanksgiving coming up, and I, I'm reminded of the uh, song that my, I sing to my grandchildren, Over the river and through the wood, now grandmother's cap I spy. Hooray for the fun is the pudding done. Hurrah for the pumpkin pie. And there's another poem that people should be familiar with, especially if they decide to pursue this. Is It's called The Ready Rule. This rule is above all others heed. Have ready everything you need. Before you start, be sure you read the whole recipe, then work with speed. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. You know, and how many times do we actually go into the kitchen, you know, especially if you don't have a recipe and you think, well, I'm going to try something new and how much hesitancy that actually takes, you know, because you're second guessing yourself. <laughs> well, yes, and I, I, I had what I had, I had not only did I have fun uh, with this cookbook, uh, with the recipes, finding these very early recipes, very simple recipes, because I had not found a cookbook that really had simple recipes for everyday folk, uh, not, not cooked in the kitchens by enslaved people for the wealthy but um i and i i had a lot of fun find going and finding the old ones old songs and the nursery rhymes and uh, ones that i had never heard of and the ones that i had remembered and we all remember figgy pudding mm-hmm. bringing us a figgy pudding um and uh, i have a recipe for fig pudding from 1889 um and uh I, I thought that was uh, a lot of fun to find these 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 verses that fit with uh, a recipe, especially like Yankee Doodle. I mean, who everyone knows Yankee Doodle, and uh, but who knows what hasty pudding is? <laughs> so I have a recipe for hasty pudding. Now, you have a lot of great recipes in here, and I, I like the way you were talking about how you collect or you look for old cookbooks. And I remember a friend of mine years ago, she was the same way. She loved collecting cookbooks, and it was funny reading one that was uh, published, I would say, somewhere right around the early part of 1900, and it said, One Day Cooking with Electricity. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I treasure my mother's cookbook from uh, Joy of Cooking from the 40s, and they had a whole section of the uh, eggless recipes, meatless recipes for uh, the wartime. So um, it's interesting how these recipes really uh, reflect the times, and I think that's something that it is what I, I – believe that I've tried to uh, share in my book is really uh, a history. Uh, It's really our history. And I was thinking about um, the holidays coming up. And really, I think for most people, the foods that we have traditionally really, you know, really define the holidays for us. Now, as I was mentioning earlier, Corn seemed to be a relatively large staple, wasn't it? Oh yes, yes, and and uh, that is really uh, my my first chapter is puddings because people I had not I mean my mother and always used her her mother's recipe for uh, Christmas pudding, so I was familiar with that, but I really wasn't familiar with any other kinds of puddings. But these puddings were so uh, they didn't take a, any. You just had to keep the water boiling. So the puddings were really, I have a recipe for Thanksgiving pudding, as a matter of fact. So, and peas pudding, uh, whether you like it hot or cold, peas pudding. Um, but the, the, other, the next chapter I have is, is the corn, because even if a farm family raised a wheat, they would sell the wheat because wheat, uh, they could get so much more for wheat than they could for corn. And corn was uh, easier uh, to, uh, to, to harvest and to, to keep. Um, and I think one of the most traditional recipes that I have 
uh, for using corn is a hoe cake. And uh, I, when I do a demonstration uh, at a Living History event, I have my very early hoe, and I'm cooking this. It's just, it's, all it is is a cornmeal uh, and uh, water and salt, you know, and, it, and, and I've had so many people look at me and they say, what are you doing? I'm saying, I'm, I'm, make, I'm baking a hoe cake. And they said, oh, it's that kind of a hoe. Ah. <laughs> 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 Crazy where some terms actually come from, huh? <laughs> but but they've heard of it. They've heard right. of hoes, mm-hmm. and they were hoe cakes were also called journey cakes or Johnny cakes. Um, and uh, in fact, Benjamin Franklin said that they were better than Yorkshire muffins. And George Washington ate them for breakfast, but they had to be swimming in honey and butter. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I think for uh, the ens- enslaved peoples um, and the working, all of the uh, farm workers, the hoe cakes were something that they could um, make to eat in the middle of the day, in the middle of the field. They would just have to take their uh, cornmeal and uh, some salt and stop by a creek and build a little fire, and they had hoe cakes. Um, so that that's a very, very early tradition in um, uh, our, uh, our country. So I think that's kind of, I think that's interesting, the, the, the hoe, hoe cakes. And uh, so there's so many uh, recipes. And, and cornbread was really called uh, Indian meal oftentimes because of the still keeping the connection and the understanding that this came from the Native Americans. Now, there was a uh, recipe in here, and I was kind of drawn to it because of its title, and then I looked at also the photograph that they show there, and I found it rather entertaining, Beaten Biscuits. And oh. It shows somebody <laughs> whacking what looks to be like uh, dough with a hammer. Well, that's not a hammer. That's an axe. <laughs> that's, that's the other side, the non-sharp side of an axe. That's traditional Maryland, and uh, I think it's southern, but... Uh, we Marylanders feel that it's ours, you know, our tradition, and um, it's uh, it's it's. Uh, I've been to those pictures that I took were from a little uh, business in Southern Maryland where there were these old ladies, some of them beating the <laughs> dough with the back of an axe, and then the others in the kitchen pu- uh, pulling off little pieces, and. Um, in fact, my uh, my granddaughter, who's five, Juliet, she's decided that she, she we're to make beaten biscuits for for Thanksgiving. She when she goes to bed, she asks her daddy to read from her grandmother's cookbook. <laughs> <laughs> so so my cookbook does appeal to all all uh, ages, and she wants a Thanksgiving pudding because there's a wonderful illustration of a of a uh, tom turkey um and that's i uh, do have a background in art and and illustration and so i i wanted to make my cookbook uh interesting visually so i have a lot of uh, botanical illustrations and and uh, and as you said colored photographs of of things like beaten biscuits but that that I'm um, glad you mentioned that because that's a, a wonderful Maryland tradition, and I'll tell you what, they're really good fresh, but within a day they are like rocks. <laughs> wow! Yeah, exactly. Oh, funny. They don't last. <laughs> now let's talk about some of the common meat that was used, and uh, people may seem like, "Wow, I didn't realize that," but things such as squirrel and rabbit were pretty readily available, weren't they? Well, yes, and I. I, in fact, I don't have any recipes for for beef in my uh, cookbook. I have a lot of venison because the the I live in the foothills of the Catoctin Mountains, which are part of the Blue Ridge, and uh, so there is still quite a lot of deer, and uh, so uh, venison and uh, 
There, the, I do have some recipes for chicken, and uh, one from Mrs. Uh, Mary Randolph in 1824, a chicken pudding, which she claims was a favorite Virginia dish. And also things that wouldn't really appeal to me personally, uh, eels. But uh, it turns out that my husband and his brothers used to catch them in the Monocacy River, and his mother would, would fix eels. So that's in some places they're still, and squirrel, um, you could go in the woods, and, you know, if you were a good shot, you it would take a good shot to get a fried squirrel. And um, the rabbits, uh, I, the rabbit smothered with onion, that is such an excellent recipe. And that's from, that is from the 1700s. That's from this uh, Belgrove cookbook that I was speaking of earlier. Um, very, you know, very early, <laughs> very early recipe. And uh, so and, uh, I had so much fun really making this, uh, putting together this cookbook. And I remembered the this, uh, Song of Sixpence and the uh, 420 blackbirds, and I did find a recipe for blackbird pie. Wow. Interesting. But uh, I don't, I mean, I, I can't, and I have not tried this recipe out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, you know, as I was uh, looking through the cookbook, it was pretty fascinating, a lot of the things that you had in recipes that would really surprise people, and I'll say this is true because I remember a time there was a place where I was living when I first discovered uh, that these were not only edible but were extremely good for you, and that is uh, dandelions. And it was funny because I had a backyard that seemed to relatively have quite a lot of these things, whereas my neighbor yard was flawlessly green, just like <laughs> if you were golfing. And I realized, you know, one day when things go south, I'm going to have plenty to eat in my backyard. He ain't going to have much of anything, you know. But let's talk about some of the things that people might be surprised that, you, that people ate back in, in them times. Uh, you know, uh, it was a very hearty group of people. Well, and they they appreciated uh, Mother Nature. They appreciated the gifts that she had for them without really anything but need but to gather them. The, uh, for example, our native persimmons, um, they're very different than what you buy in the grocery store, which is the Asian persimmon. They're much smaller. I have a picture of them in my cookbook. But And we have a tree... Uh, right out uh, uh, our farm lane, and uh, that was something that uh, uh, persimmons were used in many, many recipes, and um, uh, Native Americans used them and uh, would dry them and uh, be able to make a uh, kind of a dried pemmican out of them. Pawpaws are another thing. I don't think they go there. Pawpaws are in, out to the Midwest, and um, uh, they're very good, and elderberries are very healthy, and there's so many things you can make with elderberries, <laughs> pies and wine and jelly and stuff. So these kinds of uh, uh, it's particularly fruits and nuts were used um, very much, and I think that that tradition is, is really being lost. A, a friend of mine who's in his 90s, I was talking to him about Uh, persimmons and he said oh he said you know we used to go out Sunday afternoon after church and down this road by the river we used to pick persimmons but I bet those trees I think those trees are all gone well you know what they're not (laughs) they're still there so I went and I had never noticed them before and there they were you know these uh, persimmons which were which were kind of a I thought it was a an interesting thing that he remembered that and so that goes back uh, really quite quite far. And um, I think that where I live, which is really in Appalachia, the, uh, uh, friends of mine up in the mountains, and they're in their 90s, I've co- visited them, and she was going through dandelions that she'd picked, the greens that she'd picked, and she was just sitting there next to her cook stove going through the dandelions. And I didn't know whether she was going to make them into salad. Oh, no, she was going to she was going to cook them. So the boiled dandelions or wilted dandelions and um, things like uh, docks, our narrow dock is something that we don't think of. 
and purslane, all these things that you could put into a salad not without having to grow them uh, in, your, in your garden, I think, or, or something. And um, I think uh, the, one of the things that, that I, I noticed in these recipes is that I was finding people really had a kind of a, a natural inclination towards things that were healthy, uh, and like making sauerkraut, for example. And that was something that, you know, it was, you know, had all these, uh, you know, it's, now they're getting back to that, right? Are we getting back to the... Right. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it's it's a, something that people are now recognizing is very good for you. Um, so that's something that, uh, now that's a recipe that I got from uh, friends up in the mountains. And uh, she was uh, showing, we were talking about it, and she was showing, she came out and she brought a, a wooden tamper, which was used to tamp down the uh, sliced cabbage layer by layer. And uh, she was, she was and, uh, so uh, saying uh, that, you know, it was her mother's and her grandmother's. And so I asked her, well, how do you, how do you slice it? Because I have these old slicers, right? And she said, oh, we use a Cuisinart. There you go, sticking with the modern <laughs> stuff, right? <laughs> well, I was just, yeah, well, I didn't say it was really. And when you talk about these uh, unusual things, poke, you know, poke, poke. I've I've had poke that I from the stalking the wild asparagus, Yule Gibbons, but uh, and they're really delicious as young shoots. But anything else is poisonous, and uh, sorrel and all these things were just. Uh, were used and and uh, for for free. You know, they were our ancestors were very thrifty. Now, what were some of the more unusual things you discovered? Um, uh, more unusual. I think the most unusual thing that I that I uncovered that that I hadn't known. I I known about puddings, but uh, I have my grandmother pudding mold, but I did not realize that puddings were first put into a fabric bag. They were boiled in a bag. And uh, so they, they would be, you'd tie them and then you'd put them in the boiling water. And uh, I uncovered a, a, a nursery rhymes, sing, sing, what shall I sing? The cat has ate the pudding string. Do do what shall I do? The cat has bit it quite in two, <laughs> and so uh, I, that was something that surprised me that I had not had any idea that you would use a bag. Um, and uh, well, we we know the old saying: the proof is in the pudding, right? Right. And so you have these these um, old uh, sayings. That uh, I, you know, I had no idea, and I have actually done it. I have <laughs> cooked a pudding in a bag, but I think it's much easier if you use a tin mold or uh, a um, uh, a ceramic one. And so it, I thought that was that was really. Un- I mean, I had no idea that you'd do that in a bag. I mean, I thought I was pretty doing something pretty pretty old timey when I just to do a pudding. <laughs> much less in a in a bag, you know? Right. Well, it's all exciting stuff, and I think people will really enjoy this book. How can they find ways to maybe get this? Well, I um, I have a, uh, a website, and it's Open Hearth Cookery. Uh, and um, I, had, I don't think that I tried to do it with PayPal, but I don't think that's working, so... You people can email me, um, and uh, and uh, I we can uh, arrange that. It's um, uh, the the website has a lot of the pictures uh, from the book and explains what more what's in the book, um, and uh, so it's it's uh, thirty six dollars, and uh, it's a uh, it's got gosh. I think I've lost count over 200 recipes, and uh, it also has recipes uh, in the very back for um, 
uh, these you know kind of healthy recipes, <laughs> as you would for coughs and colds and and uh, I did want to say about the you you were had been asking about the traditions of the holidays, and I was thinking a lot about that. Um, what are, what are some of your traditions in your family for the holidays? Well, between? you know, I don't know that we actually had a lot of traditions as far as, for instance, Thanksgiving and Christmas. I mean, you know, there were times that we did the typical stuff, and then you know, eventually you'd change it up. But uh, you know, it's kind of one of those things where we just kind of did our own thing, I guess. <laughs> so you really, you really didn't have it. Well, I, I found some interesting um, descriptions of early Christmases. Uh, there's one from 1768, and they talk about uh, mince pies and a fine plum cake. And even Charles Dickens in Great Expectations in 1861 talks about a handsome mince pie had been made yesterday morning, and the pudding was already on the boil. So there you are, a boiled pudding. Oh, wow, crazy. A boiled pudding. And um, then there's a, a plum pies and plum puddings, and we all remember Jack Horner. Mm-hmm. And um, the mincemeat is an, on several recipes for mincemeat and plum puddings. And um, I even had a, found a... a a uh, quote from 1648, going back that far, and they were. Then uh, Robert Herrick talks about uh, having the uh, mince pie and the plums that are standing by. Um, so this is this these traditions go back awfully far with some of the things that I've mentioned, and I do have my my own grandmother's recipe. A Christmas pudding, but it's titled Mother's Christmas Pudding because that's what it was titled in my mother's cookbook. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, the book is Simple Fair for those of you joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. It's Kitchen Lauren Recipes from the 1800s. Our guest, Priscilla Rall. Priscilla, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. Very fascinating stuff to talk about here. Well, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate your time and I... Uh, I hope that uh, your listeners will uh, maybe think back uh, to their family's uh, traditions for the holidays, and if you have uh, the opportunity, write them down. You know, we don't. You know, we don't want these lost. And sometimes the the traditional foods that we enjoy the most are not written down. So uh, I encourage everyone to really appreciate as you sit down with your friends and family. Uh, tomorrow and giving thanks and and giving thanks to all of our uh, 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 families gone by who've uh, made these wonderful traditions for us. Well, like you said, too, you know, it's all about the stories that are embedded. They're more than just recipes, but they're actually stories, and that's what makes it all fascinating. It's a unique preservation of our history and who we are. Well, I I, I do believe that, and I think that there's a lot... uh, for us, even going back to Native Americans, and uh, it, 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 recipes get handed down for a long time. Uh, even recipes that you're fine dating from ni- early 1900s, if you look at them carefully, you can see ones that are very, very early. And they, uh, it's, it's a time when we sit down together and really appreciate. You know, we can think back to the first Thanksgiving. To whatever they had, but to just think of how people, even the early um, uh, colonials, settlers from Europe, and the Native Americans who were able to come together and share food, and that's a wonderful way that people can come together uh, uh, and share food. That is a, a commonality, and it's a it's a warm, uh, good positive thing that we can do. So I wish everybody a have very happy Thanksgiving. And on behalf of Beyond 50 and all of us, we wish you the same. Very much so. Very much so. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Priscilla, for being on the program today. You're very welcome.
We want to thank you, the listeners out there, as well as thanking you and wishing you a very happy Thanksgiving. You can also discover more at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. We do encourage you to sign up for our weekly e-newsletter. Keep up to date with what's going on in the world of Beyond 50, as well as our upcoming shows. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for joining us. This is the Beyond 50 Radio Program, and remember, live your day past halfway.